clouds and I mean the sky and everything was beautiful. There we go, we're evening out. For a while we were all on this side and now we're kind of split there. You're early. Did, did she get out? Yes. Oh, because I was going to pick her up and then I didn't hear her, so. Yeah, so they're getting some drugs in the pharmacy. Oh, okay, sure. I may have to run out of here to help her out of the car. Okay. Well, and Jesse's not with her? Oh, okay. All right. I was worried about getting in your big car. You know, being able to get in, lift her, you know, the doctor said the lower the better. Yeah. Mm. Mm. All righty. Well, I'm glad you're all here, and uh, let's uh, pray together. And this is a good group for us on Wednesday, so we're glad that you came out today on purpose. Uh, Father, thank you as we uh, dive into your word. That's what we love. We love your word. It's so uh, unbelievably powerful. It never gets old. We never get tired of the, of the stories we read, and every time we read them, we learn more about you and Father, thank you for uh, our ability to go through book after book after book and, and glean just enough to know how to study the book on our own. And so, Father, um, help us to be uh, students of the Bible. And, Father, thank you for your word, oh, the pillar and ground of truth, and we're thankful for that. Now, bless and encourage us, strengthen us, and help us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Pete and I were just talking because Rosie was uh, supposed to go home today and then when I stopped by there it didn't look like she was going to go home because her uh, her blood pressure spiked pretty high it was uh, 200 and something and over 87 or something but evidently they got it under control and um, she's um, somewhere in Hampshire <laughs> oh okay so uh, pray pray for um, Kate as that's a lot on her as well but we're thankful for uh rosie's testimony yeah all righty uh she was telling the nurse when i was in there on the day that she was in a lot of pain uh the nurse was saying something to her and she goes well i don't know why god chose to do this now but he's always right that's a pretty good testimony right there all righty well we're in the book of hosea which is the first book of the uh, minor prophets and I've mentioned this before and so I don't want to be redundant but since we're getting into that remember the um, the, the minor prophets uh, spend the majority of their time uh, talking about one issue where the major prophets are soup to nuts they talk about a lot of things and I think we equated that to like a Sears or um, a Nordstrom's or hi guys um, a Nordstrom's where the anchor stores kind of have everything in it that you need here you go and the uh, I'm going to take Kate's because she might not get here in any way you know you, I sit back there every week and I say well how many should I print and when I print um, like 20 right then five people come and when I print 15 then more than 15 come uh, so we were talking about how the how the major profits are like the anchor stores they have everything in them you can buy washing machines or clothes. But when you get down to the specialty stores in the mall, they, the, a lot of them just cover carrying maybe shoes or camera equipment or sunglasses. Yeah, Sunglass Hut, those type of stores there. And that's the way we need to look at uh, the book of Hosea and all the minor prophets is that they, they kind of latch on one thought. But one thing is consistent in every one of them is that we see the covenant-keeping God always promise, even in their rebellion, that he will carry out his covenant. And his covenant was that he would uh, be uh, king uh, through the line of David and that that would come to pass. And so uh, in the midst of all the judgment, in the midst of all the rebellion, he certainly always gives hope. Could you imagine coming every week to church or twice a week or whatever your manner of custom is to be at church and, and, and just be judgment, judgment, judgment with no hope. But God always gives an olive branch. Even, even to us in the New Testament here, he gives us his, his unconditional love. And as we begin to see that unconditional love, we move from slavish fear of who God is to a proper fear of God 
which allows us to grow in our Christ likeness because we see him more, he's still a master, but, but he's also a loving God. And we realize that all that we're going through is his divine way of molding and shaping us to be all we can be in this life before we get home and we will be perfect. And so uh, what, a, what, a, what a loving God. And sometimes we miss that because the circumstances so overwhelm us that we look at God as a slavish type of master, and he's not. He's a loving master. He's a very, very loving master. And uh, so, so, so we're thankful for that. Well, we're jumping into the Minor Prophets for the first time, so we're going to stay in Hosea for a couple weeks, and we're going to start with a lesson one here. The Old Testament, Old Testament Prophets... Uh, were used by God to communicate. Uh, Thus saith the Lord. That was always their start of their message, was always that they are the carrier of the message. And as we study the minor prophets, we must find and apply principles. So we're going to find in every book of the Bible, whether in the New Testament or Old Testament, there is a principle for us to learn. And I think a lot of what we see in the book of um, the Minor Prophets is we see a lot of the attributes of God, the attributes of God. It is good for us to know that God is perfect, he's holy, he's righteous, and so we'll see a lot of his attributes in the book of Hosea and the Minor Prophets. Bible study helps us to learn the nature and attributes of our God. God reveals himself through his word, through his word. That's where we learn about him. As we study this minor prophets, or prophets, I, I, I should have put, as we study the minor prophets, we will see attributes of God, his faithfulness, his covenant love, and his hope. The book of Hosea at times will mirror the days in which we live and face today. Yes, it is true because we play the adulterer many times in our life even today. The principles we will learn, uh, I'm sorry, the book of Hosea times will mirror the days that we live in today. The principles we'll, we'll learn over the next uh, weeks will guide us uh, for a situation we may find ourselves in or facing even ourselves. When putting our minds to study the scriptures, we must remember that there's a system or rules of engagement. Uh, if we don't take time to understand how to study God's word, we're going to be kind of all over the place, not being able to put precept upon precept and line upon line because we are just going to pick and choose different texts and we're not going to look at it as a whole. And so we have to study historically as well uh, as, as we study so we can apply. If we ignore the basic Bible study rules, we'll uh, come short of bringing truth from a dispensational approach. Some people say that the Old Testament shouldn't be preached anymore, but I disregard that because the bible says that every word is profitable the problem with it is if we just learn history the historical sense of what was going on you, they're right we miss it but when we look at it from a dispensational approach we can see there are principles that we can learn to add to our life to help guide us in any situation that we face any situation that we face we need those those um, principles we must find and bridge the principle, because we live in a different historical, culture, and geographical setting, that is why it's important to approach God's word correctly. Whenever we study the scriptures, we discover two important truths. A time much different than the day in which we live in. It's much different. When we're looking at the minor prophets here, it's, it's, it's foreign to us. It's, it's, it's different. We don't, we're not a theocracy. Uh, we're not a nation. Uh, we, we, we are under grace. Uh, things are much different. There's a difference between Israel and the church when we study the Old Testament. We can't blur those lines. And um, this is great. I just saw two boys walk in that were from um, MBT. Matthew and I believe Maddock. I think Maddock got saved and Matthew got assurance of salvation while they were here. Uh, with those two thoughts in mind, we must learn to bridge the historical, culture, and geographical differences between the biblical narrative and the modern world that we live in today. How do we do this? Well, we must find the biblical principles that transcend time and culture. You do this in a child rearing as well. You, you make it relevant, a principle that you learned as a kid on obedience or whatever that might be, or they learned 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago, 
and you teach it in a relevant way that that child can understand. Once we find the biblical principles and apply those principles to our life, God uses those biblical principles to give us a reliable standard for measuring any situation we might face in the culture in which we live in. Aren't you glad that the Bible's relevant? What would we do if it was, if it was out of touch? Biblical facts are important as they describe events such as historical culture and geographical information. Um, and, and we understand those facts, um, those principles, those truths through those facts. Okay, the Minor Prophets of Hosea uh, overview. Now, one way to divide up the Minor Prophets is to take a look at uh, what was going on in the, the life of Israel. So some of the Minor Prophets fit into the Assyrian crisis. In other words, this is long before Babylon swept in and took him into captivity for the 70 years. There was a time that Assyria was, was the big dog on the block. And uh, so there are prophets that are, are prophesying about uh, the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, and warning them uh, to get right with God. And of course, they refused to. But So Hosea f falls in that area of the Assyrian crisis. That's, that, that was the enemy at the time for the nation of um, Israel. And then, then, then the second uh, phase of that would be the uh, Babylonian crisis. And that is when they sweep in and they take the Babylonian or they take the southern kingdom. And then there's the restoration crisis. In other words, there's prophets, minor prophets, that, that talk about the rest, restoration of Israel. So there's three different groups that will categorize those minor prophets in. And this one, Hosea, is found in the um, Assyrian crisis. The book of Hosea ministered to Israel primarily during the, the reign of uh, Jeroboam um, II. Uh, he was a very evil king. Uh, his reign was marked by material prosperity and territorial expansion, but also spiritual uh, decline during his rule. Uh, many consider his reign to be the high point in the history of the northern kingdom. After that, it went down pretty quick. Hosea's theme was the unchanging love of God for his, his, his people despite their sins. We see that today, don't we? God loves us despite our sins. Uh, he's not happy with them and he is judging it, but Hosea's theme was an unchanging love though. The first three chapters deal with the relationship of Hosea and his wife, Gomer. Illustrates the, uh, Gomer illustrates the relationship of God to, an, to the nation of Israel. Uh, Gomer illustrates the relationship of God, of God so he's, he's the picture of God. And then, of course, um, uh, uh, Hosea is, and then uh, Gomer, the wife, is the relationship of an unfaithful um, Israelite. Hosea experiences the full pain of his wife's unfaithfulness as God himself experiences the pain of Israel's unfaithfulness to him. To him. The following chapters, uh, 4 through 13, so that's 1 through 3, and that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, uh, but in the following chapters, 4 through 13, deal with the charge of God against Israel for their sins. These charges are not arranged in a logical manner, but consistent of repeating charges of God against their wickedness and are marked by the use of illustrations and figures that describe the conduct of Israel. In the final chapters of the book, um, uh, speaks of God's ultimate, rest ultimate restoration of his people. So in summary, we could say the book of Hosea illustrates the spiritual or emotional aspect of the covenant that Jehovah has made with his people. Hosea's message stresses God's unchanging love for his people despite their sins. Now that word that he's unchangeable would be immutable. That would be the, 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 the term that we would use is that he does not change. Can anybody think of a verse in the Bible that um, states that, that God is unchangeable? Anybody think of maybe a verse maybe in Hebrews? He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. He, he, he never, ever changes. Can anybody think of anything else? Anything else that would kind of talk about him? Uh -huh. 
Yes. That is excellent. And he does not change. He's consistent. Um, that ought to be a goal of ours, too, is that we would remain consistent in our attitudes towards one another, towards one another as well. Okay, so an object lesson of the reality of God's love and Israel's rejection of that love. So let's look at uh, Hosea chapters, chapter 1, and let's look at the first three verses. I'll read verse number 1, and you can read verse number 2. And then I'll pick up on verse number three. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Burai, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibilaam, I hope I'm saying that, Liam, which conceived and bare him a son. So uh, the principle that we can glean tonight is the unchangeable, unchanging attribute of God's love. Throughout our narrative, we'll see that God's love for Israel is unchanging, but yet he's just. So he calls out their sin, but his love for them does not change. God is immutable. He proves his love by his willingness to go after Israel. Can I say that's the same today? That's the price that you and I pay for having a father that loves us so much that he is going to come after us. But he's not going to come after us with a stick. He's going to come after us with love. Now, sometimes that love seems to be hateful or maybe to get even, but it never is. Every trial that's hurtled at us or any position to restore us in that, in that love is, 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 is his chastisement comes from a heart of love, a heart of love. And a lot of times what we have is we have, as we grew up, sometimes our parents, the way that they chastised us was not always in love. Sometimes it was out of convenience. Uh, sometimes it was out of, um, out of uh, anger. Or uh, I've mentioned this before, I can remember Nancy always being very uh, more um, calm than I was, was would always say, wait before you go upstairs. Don't go upstairs yet. Because she's right, because if I would have gone upstairs right there, it would have been to satisfy my <laughs> lust for getting even, instead of maybe what God was doing in their heart. And so um, th that's the same thing, but God's love uh, is, 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 and his attribute and God's attributes never change. So we can expect the same love towards us even today. What a great principle. Because God's uh, love towards his people was unchangeable and because God's unchangeable yesterday, today, and what? Forever, then we can count on that today that God's love is consistent. God's love is for us. I know the thoughts I have towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of what? of an outcome that would bring glory and honor to his name. Uh, some people don't like this verse because it sounds very uh, Calvinistic, but we can't get away from it. And take your Bibles and look at um, um, chapter 8 of the book of Romans. Chapter 8 of the book of Romans. And we know verse 28 very well. Most of you could probably stand up and quote it immediately because we use it very often in many things that transpire in our life. So let's read 28 and 29 together. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed into the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So God has promised that his love, the moment we get saved, we, we, we learn of his love factually. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the 
He gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So factually, when the gospel's preached and Christ is lifted up, we see factually that there is a God that loves us and has demonstrated that, and through the cross we can be saved. But then experientially is after we get saved, we see God working in us to demonstrate that love where we become uh, respectful of him, not like Satan was. He was a terrible master. We see we have a loving master. We realize that God wants the best for us. We realize that God wants to work in our life to change us and expose things, even if it hurts, so that our life will make a difference now and even into the future. That's a loving God. Um, and that is what we're learning here, too. That's what God is trying to do with the nation of Israel. So the scriptures use the word hesed, H-E-S-E-D, to define this kind of love. Hesit is difficult to translate. No single word in the English language can capture its meaning. Translators use the word like kindness, loving kindness, mercy, loyalty, perhaps loyal love is the closest to describe this word. And that is the word that God has for us. So if Israel would just realize that God's love is loyal love, He's not trying to hurt them. He's trying to bring them along. If they would realize that, then their loyalty to him would probably be right. But they, they almost look at God as a slavish type of love or a slavish master. Hesed is one of the richest and most powerful words in the Old Testament. It reflects the loyal love that people committed to God of the Bible should have for one another. It's not a mood. It is a fact that we can love one another because God loves us with that loyal love as well. Hesed is, is not primarily something people feel, it's something people do for other people who have no claim on them. Well, if the book of Hosea were a Broadway play, how many of you have ever been to a Broadway play? I've never been to a Broadway play, but how many of you have been to a Broadway play? Okay, the storyline would grab its audience immediately. It is just look how it starts. God takes and says, I want you to marry a woman of whoredom. Now, men, how would you like that? At 20 years old, the Lord comes and talks to you and says, I want you to marry a woman of whoredom. That would really be something that would be unbelievable. But it's not a play. It is God's way of revealing himself to us through his word. So he is going to demonstrate his love by setting up this story of a faithful husband and an unfaithful spouse. And he's going to use that as an illustration to show that even when Israel is unfaithful to him, he still loves them. Now let's think about something here. And I don't know if I have all the answers here. I, I, I have a thought, but of course... Um, uh, we have to be careful about those type of things, but it's interesting to talk about. And that is, uh, we know that the Bible is very clear that a, an Israelite was not to marry a woman of whoredom. The Bible is very clear about that. He's, he said that that was never to be done, but yet we see God who can't violate his own character. We know that. He can't sin, but yet it appears from the way the verbiage is written here in Hosea, he is doing exactly that. So just think about that. We don't have to answer it today. We can talk about it next, next week unless somebody has a thought on it. Right now, I have a thought on it. But um, I'm ahead of you. I've been studying it for a while. And, um, but, you know, we kind of blow through that when we read that. But that, that's a problem. If you're just reading that on the face, you would say, oh, my goodness, what is going on here? It'd be like God saying to you, listen, I need you to go murder your neighbor because I'm going to show this illustration. Or I want you to go steal from the company because I'm going to show this illustration. So you go in and embezzle money, or you go, right? You would say, well, God can't do that. God wouldn't do that. So I want you to think about that this week. And um, next week when we get back, why don't you give me what your thoughts are as you study that out? Unless you have a comment now that maybe you're already something you thought about. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that um, next week. 
Uh, so God is revealing himself through his word. He always reveals himself through his word. We do not find out about the Lord apart from his word. <laughs> Genesis to Revelation give us everything we need to know about God. And, 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 and it's in the canon there, and we can trust that. Um, it also allows us to see how God deals with his people. How God deals with this situation in the book of Hosea is the same way he deals with us even today, today, in the day and age that we live in. So as we study God's word, it's important that we understand that God does not think as we think or act as we act. His thoughts, motives, and ways are always pure, and they are always perfect. Always, always, always perfect. Um, we might not understand his ways, however, we can trust him based on his unchanging character. I think that that is how Job survived, is he learned a lesson to trust God even when he couldn't understand. Instead of Job complaining, <clears throat> the question, or the, us complaining, um, I'm sure that each one of you have gone through some very difficult times in your life. Some of you are going through maybe real difficult times even tonight. There might have been something in the last week or two weeks or a month or something like that that has overwhelmed you. So instead of asking why, we ought to probably say, God, what are you trying to teach me? What is it that I need to get from this? What are you doing? For Job, God was showing him as a display of faithfulness. Job couldn't see that. So how do you get through something like what Job went through? Uh, certainly his friends were no help. So it must be on the character of God that God's thoughts towards us are always right. He loves us and he does never sets us up as a mark to hurt or to demean or to um, destroy. That is not God's purpose of his, to his children. Um, for my thoughts... This is, uh, uh, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, this is Isaiah, neither are my ways, either are your ways my ways, saith the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Aren't you glad that we can't figure God out? Could you imagine if we just put God in a box? We just kind of figured it all out and, you know, no, no, there's so much to God. So we read uh, chapters, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The storyline is clear to understand. God is asking Hosea to be a human object lesson. What would you do if God asked you to be a human object lesson? He probably already has. Do, do, do we yield to that and allow him to work in our life, or do we, do we run from it, not allowing, us, not allowing us to see what he wants to teach us, but also how he wants to use us? Oh, yeah, maybe not even recognize it. Hosea is to present a pageantry, a presentation to Israel through his marriage. The nation of Israel must understand the message. The root word of pageantry is pageant. The word pageant, pageant is defined as an activity of equivalent of something or resulting in equivalent. So in other words, it is, it is an activity that will draw something of equal force, a picture, something for both sides to learn. So Hosea's pageantry would open the eyes of Israel's, Israel to God's thoughts. God's thoughts. Here is the message. Hosea would play the part of God. The, the woman, Gomer, is going to play the part of God's people. The reason she is going to run away and be unfaithful is because this is the way God's people act in their spiritual marriage that God has established. Do we see that today? We do. God is a spouse or already married to Israel, but we are the bride, but at times we run and we play, we play um, the adulterer at times, even today, by running to other gods, trusting in other ways, uh, trusting in this world or trusting in uh, um, um, idolatry or trusting in ourselves. And so it's no different even today. God tells Hosea he will be faithful to Gomer because God is faithful to Israel. 
even though she dishonors his name. So when you read the first three chapters of Hosea, look in there and look for how faithful Hosea is to Gomer is the same way that God is faithful to us today and he was back then. He just is faithful. So when you take time this week and maybe you read those first three chapters, try to look at that. Now let's think about something. During the time of Hosea, when that was written, who would be the major prophet? Isaiah. And so Isaiah would be, if you read the first chapter of the book of um, Isaiah, you will see Isaiah saying the same thing. He is saying this to them. Hey, listen, you're very religious, but your heart is far from me. In fact, I'll tell you what, Israel, quit bringing your sacrifices to me because they stink in my nostrils. And in fact, you know what? I don't want your sacrifices. I'm not looking for that. What was he looking for? The clean heart, their devotion, their love. It, the sacrifice was just a means of showing that, but they were, they were keeping the, the, the letter of the law, so to say, but their hearts were far from God. They were just going through um, uh, just the routine of the religious sacrifice. That's why David says in Psalm 51 that he doesn't want ceremonial cleansing. He doesn't want to go through by bringing an animal for the sin of Bathsheba. He wants God to clean and scrub him and make him clean again, and make him clean. And that's the same with us. Did you know you could be here tonight because it's a religious activity? Your heart might be very far from God right now. I mean, you look all cleaned up. But really, our heart could be, we never even much thought about tonight. Maybe we just got in our car and we drove here and we never really even thought why we were even coming here tonight. We got here tonight, and we, we, we got here because we come here every week, and you sit in about the same seats. And, and, and that was the same thing that Israel was doing. They, 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 they were going through things, and God gives this illustration, uh, this, this play, this, uh, the reality of the way that uh, Gomer was treating um, Jose, Hosea was the same way that we see Israel was treating God, unfaithful. And it was dishonoring his name. The reason that, 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 the reason that, the, the reason that led Israel to unfaithfulness was prosperity. Is prosperity a sin? Absolutely not. When does prosperity cross the line? When you make it your God. Yes, it sounds like us as individuals at times. Hmm. Sure, sure, when your prosperity becomes more important or replaces God, and that's what happened there. It was a time in the northern kingdom that was the zenith of their prosperity. They never had risen to that much prosperity, nor would they again. But under Jeroboam II, there was great prosperity. In other words, you can be in great sin and still be prospering and think you're okay. Is that not true with us? They're still at Walmart. Every shelf is stocked with about 25 different cereals. We have peanut butter that is, has peanuts in it. We have peanut butter that have jelly in it. We have creamy. We have chunky. We, who knows? They might even have diet peanut butter. Who knows? But they have every, you have uh, purified water. You have spring water. You have everything uh, possible that we could we are prospering even though we have our problems right now inflation's high we understand some of the things that are not working quite right but we're still pretty good our refrigerators are pretty full our freezers have a lot of meat in it though the costs are going up we still have and this is what was happening here they were they were prospering but they weren't giving God the glory they weren't using that that prospering for what needed to be done to further God's work. The whole purpose of God establishing Israel and placing Israel in the center of the earth, center of the world, was so that as people came by, they would see there was a God in heaven. 
That was the whole purpose. When these caravans would travel through that area of Israel, which was a central location right there off the Mediterranean, the central location there was that they would see that there is a God. They would see that God raised up these people. Well, isn't that the purpose of Faithway Baptist Church? That all those that cross Washington and these side streets here would see that there is a God and there is a Savior and there is hope. And they see that through us. And if we tarnish it, it's hard to see. And that's what was happening. This was a mockery of God's intention in Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1, where he calls Abram, Abram at the time to be the father of the nation. So we have that today even too. God blessed Israel as he had promised. They had begun to live for pleasure though. They had abandoned hard work. They had abandoned morality and uh, integrity in order to live for themselves. In fact, other prophets said they were fixing up their homes before they were taking care of the house of God. And so he says, you have holes in your bags. You have holes in your bags. You think that you're prospering, but actually you're working twice as hard and you're getting less because you are not making the first thing the main thing. What's the main thing? The main thing is our worship and our love for God. So that can happen even today. I remember when I was on the ship, I didn't drink coffee. I did occasionally for some watches just to stay awake. You know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's hard to stay awake. And, uh, and I remember that coffee was a, a top commodity. And when you would go and get the coffee, and sometimes I was told to do that, I, um, my first time of getting it, they, they actually put it into a um, garbage bag, you know, so much of it. And then you would carry it over your back, you know, and you would carry it up. And um, I didn't know this, but I learned after the first time I did it, I wish they would have told me, was um, there was coffee thieves. <laughs> And what they would do is, if you were walking, they'd get behind you and they'd poke your bag, and as your coffee fell out, they'd have a bag there filling up a bag as much as they could. So by the time you get up there, you're, the coffee's almost all gone. Um, and so um, I remember my first time I got up there and the coffee was spilling out all over the place. I couldn't figure out what went on. And the guy told me, you got to walk with that in front of you. <laughs> because they, they, they wanted it. And that's, and that's what was happening here, too, in, in, in these times, was they were prospering but they were losing everything because they were consuming it upon pleasure. Well, let's look at some of these. I think this was brought up in a little meeting that we had here today because we were talking about jobs and working. Is it hard to find workers today? You guys that employ people, I know Craig, you employ, and it's been hard. You've had to use agencies that you maybe never had to use before to try to find somebody to get into your workplace. And others of you that are employers here, uh, you might have found the same thing. Maybe you work somewhere. I know there, uh, I think at Elgin, there are 200 and, how many names? Was it 200? Oh, 100. 100 teachers short. The hospitals isn't necessarily because they don't have beds. They don't have enough people to cover the beds. So you can't just bring people up there because there's no one to care for them. And the nurses are running crazy because they can't find work. So, so they've abandoned hard work. I, I think our nation has done that. Uh, what about morality? We're pretty moral, our nation, wouldn't you say? I'd say we're pretty strong in our morality. No, our morality is, is cracking and falling apart. So we see some of these same things that was same with Israel. Uh, hard work, morality, and integrity. Uh, people were living for themselves. I think we see that a lot today. They were corrupt in their dealings with one another. And truth had fallen in the streets. It's hard to distinguish what is truth anymore because it's so pounded into people that this is normal now that it becomes normal. I think Goebbels said that in World War II. If we just keep repeating it, the people will believe it. And certainly that took place. They demonized the Jews, of course, and other races as well, uh, to the point where they believed a lie. So their religion, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Hmm. 
it's a, certainly a desperate time, and, and we're, we're seeing that also. But yet we are prospering. Um, their religion was by sight. Uh, uh, um, uh, Judges chapter 1, 21 through 36, that's a whole uh, narrative, but this is something you can study when you go home. The religion, and this is what I talked about, and we can go there, there's just a few verses. Why don't we turn there? I kind of, I didn't quote it word for word, I just kind of summarized it. Go back to Isaiah, because that would be the time that um, Hosea was prophesying as well, about that same time. Isaiah uh, chapter 1, 16 through 18. And I'll read 16, you read 17, I'll read 18. So in Isaiah chapter number 1, verse number 16. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red with crimson, they shall be as wool. And so that's the commentary, because if you read all those verses before that, you will see that he says, like in verse 13, Bring no more vain uh, uh, oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the callings of assemblies, I cannot away, um, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the, even, your, even the solemn meetings, your new moons. He just goes on and on and on. In um, verse 11, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of the rams and the fat of the fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks and lambs or in goats. So what he wants from them is their heart. And that's what God, God wants both. He wants our worship, but he, he wants it out of an unfeigned heart. Their religion was a sham. Let's look at Isaiah 29, 13. If I could have somebody read that. 29, 13. Yeah, so, um, and, and, and we see that Jesus quotes that same verse in the Gospels. He, he, he quotes the same verse there as well. So um, Hosea's cry is that the people have been unfaithful to God, just as an adulterous wife is unfaithful to her husband. In spite of their unfaithfulness, God would manifest his love through Hosea as the story unfolds. Good thing that there's the last two chapters in the book of Hosea. We must always keep a distinction between the nation of Israel and the church. However, we can see similarities that do not violate the difference between the two. We do see that these same things transpire when we place God out of the way here would be an example and a worthy discussion um, to have about the church age or the age we're in. So here's a few questions. If we want to comment on them, we can be see, before we see our video. Does the church today live by faith? Uh, Israel was not living by faith anymore. They were living by sight. So let me ask you something. Let's not worry about other people's churches. Let's just talk about our church. Does our church live by faith? Are we living by faith? Are we trusting the Lord for all of our provisions here? Are we trusting the Lord in every area? Because what does it say in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6? For it is what? Impossible. Without faith, it is impossible to what? Praise God. That's why the, 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 the plowing of the field was sin in Isaiah because they were doing it outside of faith. You have to do it by faith. So let me ask you, maybe it's more rhetorical or not, because it's really hard to judge our own church. You know, it is, but we need to. You know, does this church live by faith? Does your pastor live by faith? Do you guys live by faith? Sure. Yeah, 
And so are we living by faith then? You know, we know that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's where the temple, the, the, the Holy Spirit resides. But do we live by faith? Um, do we give lip service while pursuing our own goals? You know, we can get in the habit of just coming to church. But is it just lip service? Go ahead. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, Pam. This last one, I, I want to phrase it in a certain way. I just don't want to say, does God have our hearts completely? Because I don't think any of us would stand up here and say, there's no doubt about it. I'm just submitted in all areas. I'm just, I just don't think that that's going to be the case. So let's phrase it this way. Let's, let's phrase it this way. What, rhetorical, what areas would you write down right now, if I asked you to write down three that the Holy Spirit brings to your mind that you probably already know what they are, what three things do you need to give over to the Lord that you know you're not? I guess that's a better way to phrase the question today. Because I know God has your hearts in many areas. I know. I, I know he does. Because I know you. I, this is the crowd that I see the most often. I'm around you uh, quite a bit. And so I know your heart. I've, I've known some of you for 25 years, 20-some years. And I know... Um, your, your heart, so I know that there, you have given areas of your heart over to the Lord completely. I know that. But what areas would you say the Lord is, is maybe nobody else knows, but you know, of course. What areas of that right now are really not submitted to him? Maybe it's an anger issue. Maybe it's a jealousy issue. Maybe it's a, a selfish issue. Maybe it's, you know, whatever that would be that the Holy Spirit would would, would certainly show in your heart. That's, that's where you need to work on right there. So is, is to constantly be looking every day, God, what areas of my dedication do I need to recommit or do I need to surrender to you? Surrender to you. It can be an attitude. It can be an action. It can be a response. It can be ma many different ways, but certainly the Holy Spirit uh, is able to bring those to your thoughts. 
Okay, so what we're going to do then is next week is we'll cover a good section of three or four more chapters, and then we'll cover one more, and then we'll move on to the next book. But um, the video is very good um, today, and so we'll watch that. And we're going to go ahead because we're going to go past one through three. So you're going to see a little bit more in there. I watched it today for the first time. I didn't um, have time earlier. Uh, this, this work right here has um, been prepared years ago. I've, I've taught this several times uh, in years past, and uh, a lot of it is from a guy, I want to give him credit. His name is Dr. Sam Worth. I met him at um, Crown College one day, and he taught the Mayan Prophets. I love the Mayan Prophets. It's one of my favorite studies. I remember uh, sitting down and talking to him, and I thought I knew a lot about the Mayan Prophets. Okay, I knew nothing. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm like a child. As I started talking in my childhood gibber, he gave me about four pages that he had written up on it. Just phenomenal. And uh, so um, I really want to give him credit. I told him I was going to use some of his material in the future, which I have. And uh, he's very, very, very good. Dr. Sam Worth is retired now. I never see him anymore. But for years, I would see him when I recruited at uh, Crown College. All right, but let me um, get to the video here. Find mentors. I look for them everywhere. I love sitting down with men and that 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 and, and maybe ladies with ladies or with uh, as husband and wife with a husband and wife that just are so much further down the road than we are maybe in some areas. You can learn um, so, so so much from them. Okay, uh, we should be ready to go. Let me just um, make sure my volume is up. It is. It might be a little loud. I'll turn it down if it is. And let me hear, hit the button here. And we should be okay. The book of the prophet Hosea. Hosea lived in the northern kingdom of Israel, which he sometimes calls Ephraim or Jacob, here. about 200 years after they had broken off from southern Judah. Remember the story from 1 Kings. Hosea was called to speak on God's behalf during the reign of one of Israel's worst kings, Jeroboam II. The nation was descending into chaos, and in the year 722, the big bad Assyrian Empire swooped in and decimated Israel. Again, see the story in 2 Kings. And Hosea had seen all of this coming. The book is a collection of some 25 years of his preaching and writing. It's almost all poetry. And this whole collection has been designed to have three main sections. Let's just dive in and you'll see how it works. The opening part tells the story of Hosea's broken marriage to a woman named Gomer, who commits adultery. Now, it's not totally clear whether Gomer slept around with other men before or only after they got married, but they did have three children together and things fell apart. The important point is that God tells Hosea that despite Gomer's unfaithfulness, he is to go find her, to pay off her debts to her lovers, and to commit his love and faithfulness to her once again. And then God says that all of this, the broken and repaired marriage, the children, it's all a prophetic symbol telling the story of God's relationship to Israel. So God has been like a faithful husband to Israel. He rescued them out of slavery. He brought them to Mount Sinai, where he entered into a covenant with them. He asked them to be faithful to him alone. But then he brought Israel into the promised land, and they took all the abundance that he gave them, and they dedicated it to the worship of the Canaanite god Baal. And so God has a legitimate reason. He could end the covenant and divorce Israel, and he thinks about doing so, but instead. He says that he's going to pursue Israel again and renew his covenant with them. And he says why. It's purely because of his own love, compassion, and faithfulness. Hosea then spells out what all this means. He says the consequences for Israel's rebellion will be imminent defeat by other nations and exile. But there's hope for future restoration. One day Israel will once again repent and come back to worship their God. And Hosea says he will place over them a new messianic king from the line of David who will bring God's blessing. And so this opening section introduces all the main ideas of the book. Israel has rebelled, and God's going to bring severe consequences, but God's own covenant love and mercy are more powerful than Israel's sin. And so in the remaining sections of the book, Hosea's poetry explores these themes in more depth. So there are two collections of his accusations and warnings for Israel, and then each of these is concluded by a very hopeful poem about God's mercy and hope for the future. So chapters 4 through 10... Hosea explores the causes and effects of Israel's unfaithfulness. 
He says numerous times that Israel lacks all knowledge or understanding of God. The Hebrew word to know, which is yada, it's more than just intellectual activity. It describes personal relational knowledge. It's the difference between just knowing about someone and then actually knowing that someone. And God wants Israel to know him like that in a relationship. He wants them to experience his love for them and become the kind of knowledge that transforms their hearts and lives so that they love him in return. And so this is why Hosea is constantly exposing the hypocrisy of Israel's worship. He constantly shows how they're breaking the Ten Commandments, how they're allowing grave injustice in their communities, and then they go to their sacred temples and they offer sacrifices to God like everything is just fine. But it's not fine. And not only because of their hypocrisy, but because they're worshiping all of these other gods too. He mentions many times their altars to Baal at the cities of Bethel and Gilgal. And not only have they given their allegiance to other gods, Hosea repeatedly accuses Israel for trusting in their political alliances with Egypt and Assyria. So instead of trusting God to protect them, they want to become like these nations and rely solely on military power. And God says it's all going to come crashing down on their heads because in not too long, Assyria will turn on them and come to ravage their lands. In this other section of warning, Hosea gives an ancient Israelite history lesson to show how this family has been unfaithful from the beginning. So he alludes to the patriarch Jacob's lying and treachery. Remember Genesis 27 and 28. He alludes to Israel's rebellion in the wilderness. Remember the book of Numbers. He alludes to their appointment of the corrupt king Saul who led the people into sin and disaster. Remember the stories in 1 Samuel. This is all Hosea's way of saying some things in this family never change. So what hope does Hosea have? Well, we know from chapter 3 that God's going to do something to save and restore his people, and that's what these two concluding chapters explore. Chapter 11 is beautiful. The poem depicts God as a loving father who raised his son Israel and then shared everything with him. But the son grew up and rebelled and turned on the father, taking advantage of his generosity. And so in this poem, God is emotionally torn apart. One moment he's angry, and naturally he says he's going to bring severe consequences. But the next moment he's heartbroken. And then he says that he's moved by his mercy and compassion, and he's going to forgive the son that he loves. He says, how can I give you up, Ephraim? My heart churns inside of me. All my compassion is aroused. And so while God did allow Israel to be conquered by Assyria, face the consequences, that's not God's final word. There's still hope. And that's what the last chapter is about. Hosea calls Israel to repent and turn back to their God, but he knows that it won't last because it never has before. And God says that one day he will heal their waywardness and love them freely. God goes on to describe this new healed Israel as a lush tree that will grow deep roots and broad branches and offer shade and fruit to all of the nations. It's an image of God's promise to Abraham, how Israel was to become a blessing to the nations. And God saying, if that's ever going to happen, it's going to require an act of God's grace and healing power to repair the deep brokenness and sinful selfishness of the human heart so that God's people can receive his love and love him in return. This is what God promises to do. Now, after this poem concludes, we find the very last words of the book. They're like an appended note. They're likely from the author who collected Hosea's poetry and now wants to speak to you, the reader, for a second. And he says, who is wise and discerning to understand all of this? In other words, Hosea's poems. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. So the author wants you to know that Hosea's ancient poetry to northern Israel is not locked in the past. It reveals deep truths about God's character and purposes and human nature. And while God should and does bring his justice on human evil, his ultimate purpose, his heart, is to heal and to save his people. And that's what the book of Hosea is all about. That's a great study, the part here where, uh, let me see where it is on here, where, oh, the tree and healing fruit. That's quite a study. That's um, very interesting. It's mentioned often. 
Alrighty, so uh, we learned a little bit more about Hosea. So when you get there in your regular Bible reading or you choose to start to study it, you'll have some notes that you can pull out. And you know that when you look at, at uh, Hosea 1 through 3, what are you going to see? The object lesson. You're going to see the whole reason for the book is set out in 1 through 3. And then you're going to see from 4 to whatever it is, 9 or 10 or whatever, I think it's to, to, to 9 or to 10, you're going to see the individual sins pointed out and they were trusting other armies and so on. Then you're going to see that Assyria will sweep down and they do take the northern kingdom into captivity. But then when Babylon sweeps down years later, hundreds of years later, it captures Assyria first bringing the northern kingdom into their control and then they sweep down and they take the southern kingdom as well and so all this kind of comes together and and these prophets are consistent in um in 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 their in their in their judgment on Israel but they all end with the wonderful hope of restoration of restoration praise God praise God so but we don't live there we live here we're the local church we're filled with grace Grace is to help us to live the Christian life, not to always use it to get right. Grace is great, but it's really for us to, to fulfill going out and doing what God wants us to do, not always having to get right with that grace, which I'm glad for it. But the goal is, is that we would use that grace to spill out in our lives into our community to make a difference for God. So, yes, there's a lot of lookalikes, but we are not the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was already married to God or espoused to him. That's why we have the marriage supper of the Lamb one day. We have the marriage supper still coming. They were already espoused. They were already um, a marriage covenant to him. Well, Father, thank you for the scriptures. There's so much. How in the world do we unpack something this large, this quickly? It's impossible. This is just a lifelong study. None of us can capture it all. There's so much about Hosea that I have no clue about. It's so deep. It's so, it's so interesting. It's so there. It's so relevant to where we live. Help us to be um, uh, Bibulous. Help us to be uh, uh, people of the word. Help us not to just get to a point where we say, well, I already know all that. No, 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 no. Help us, Lord. Help us to see the goodness and your love is captured in every one of these pages. So thank you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. It's good. Good to hear the kids yelling. And they have balloon animals and they're running outside. That is a good sign. And mothers picking their kids up. That's even a better sight. <laughs> if they forget one, if one of you could take one home. <laughs>